Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, so I thought that based on the sort of a timing of the talk, uh, it was um, uh, better to focus a little bit more on the applied side uh, rather than pick something uh, more theoretical. Uh, and also to highlight sort of a, a rapidly increasing gap between what we theoretically understand uh, about deep models and where they are heading uh, in practice. Uh, so this is a uh, very real context that we are actually working on with a larger group. I will highlight that. Uh, in terms of uh, understanding how to represent molecules, how to make predictions based on molecules, how to uh, create molecules, uh, entirely novel molecules, uh, uh, with desirable uh, characteristics. So just a, a bit of background and feel free to jump in and ask any uh, questions here. Uh, so uh, what are molecules as graphs? We uh, uh, know about the annotated graphs. So what's particular about molecules uh, as graphs? So you have, um, here's a particular antibiotic uh, molecule. It has node labels, so the atoms uh, vary uh, in its node. Uh, you have edge labels, uh, atoms are bonded together of different uh, types of bonds. You have substructures that are kind of a larger motifs that are actually important structurally how these uh, uh, graphs uh, behave as molecules. And you also have 3D information that are the little wedges there that kind of highlight whether the thing goes in, uh, into the board or uh, uh, out of the board. Okay, so why, why are these type of structures then interesting from a machine learning perspective? Uh, why would we uh, want to work on them in terms of uh, from an algorithms or theory uh, perspective? Well, they are very rich and complex objects and their properties actually depend sometimes very intricately, intricately about the fine structural uh, details. Uh, so it's a complex real uh, problem that we want to solve. There's quite a bit of data about molecules, uh, but it's not uh, uniform data. There's small data, there's big data, um, and there's uh, heterogeneous da data of different kinds. But you have quite a bit of data to learn about how, uh, what these objects are and uh, what they should do. There are tons of uh, interesting estimation and inferential problems uh, in this context. And just to name a few is uh, the standard machine learning problem. You have an object, you predict its properties. That already is a challenging problem with these type of uh, structures. Uh, molecular optimization means that the, you give me a molecule, uh, it's known as a lead, so things that you already know is sort of good, and you want to somehow automatically turn that into a molecule that's actually good, uh, say as a drug. Okay, So that's a, a molecular optimization problem. So what I'm uh, going to focus here in this talk uh, is there is uh, essentially a broader problem of drug automated drug design. How do we solve this problem algorithmically? And there are two components uh, to it, trying to understand properties. If, you, if I can't predict properties, I don't know how to uh, modify it. Um, and then how I uh, actually solve the optimization problem, turning it into a better version, uh, uh, turning it into an entirely new uh, molecule. So uh, uh, this is not work in isolation. This is, uh, there's actually a large consortium of uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies, 14 major pharmaceutical companies and uh, uh, chemistry, chemical uh, engineers, as well as computer science faculty, myself and uh, Regina Barzilai. Uh, that are working on a range of problems related to molecules from a machine learning uh, perspective. Uh, so you uh, try to uh, lift the chemical literature into a computational form that can be used for models. That's an NLP task. Uh, this is the molecular property uh, prediction, molecular optimization part that I will uh, focus on. Uh, you can try to understand reactions that are kind of a step beyond individual molecules. You have a set of molecules and you want to predict what comes out of that reaction. So it's a set of structures to a set of structures uh, problem. And you want to optimize those reactions for, so that a particular compound is uh, more likely to come out of the uh, reactions. And also then uh, something called a retrosynthesis uh, problem. You're given a molecule. Uh, this is what I wish to manufacture. How do I find the sequence of steps to actually get there? So that's uh, often formulated as a sort of a reinforcement learning problem. It's a type of inverse problem where you have an uh, inverse problem you're solving is actually a sequence of uh, structural steps. Okay. 
But uh, today I'll just focus on uh, one uh, part of it and try to highlight that further. Uh, so uh, the problem here is uh, automated drug design. So you're given a molecule, some design specs uh, that are essentially properties that you want this molecule uh, to have. You want to increase the potency against a particular target. Uh, you want to make it less toxic, uh, more soluble, have some other drug-like characteristics, and so on. Okay? So those are design specs, and then you need to translate that molecule into a new version that has those properties. That's the task. Okay? Now, uh, there are many things that we need to understand in order to solve this problem. We need to uh, understand how to represent the mo molecules in the first place, uh, how to make predictions uh, effectively based on those representations, uh, and then also how do we realize this new molecule that will be an potentially an entirely novel uh, molecule that nobody has seen uh, before. The molecular space that's still unexplored is actually quite vast. The uh, pharmaceutical industry tends to focus, uh, justifiably so, on a smaller uh, piece of it. So there's quite a bit of potential in these type of approaches. All right, so from a machine learning perspective, let's uh, focus on the representation and prediction uh, uh, for a little bit, just to highlight a little bit of the um, theoretical background here. The standard workhorse for uh, machine learning on graphs is a graph neural network, uh, hopefully familiar to uh, most of you. Uh, it's a message passing uh, um, uh, algorithm on graphs. Uh, you start from a simple, say, atom representation, which atom is in a particular location, how is it bonded uh, with others. Uh, so you have features on the nodes, you have features on the uh, edges, and you want to pass messages so as to get a representation, say, for an atom that actually captures the local molecular context in which that atom uh, appears in, in that molecule. Okay? And drive that representation towards being able to predict properties of that uh, molecule. Okay? So it's a uh, potentially complicated neural network model, uh, but it has few sort of uh, uh, important pieces uh, as computational problems uh, that will turn out as limitations as we'll see uh, shortly. So the first step is that how do I uh, look at my neighbors, other atoms that are bonded uh, to me, and how do I aggregate that information uh, 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 to better update my own representation, okay? And that aggregation step is typically carried out as a multi-set, okay? So the neighbors in these algorithms are exchangeable from the point of view of the algorithm, okay? And that's actually, a, a, in some sense, a strength and a major weakness in this, uh, in this uh, context. Uh, once you aggregate, they can, you can combine the note information and the, your previous uh, representation and update uh, uh, to get a better representation of what that uh, uh, node should capture. Uh, the final step is then once you get these uh, representation for each atom, how do I aggregate them together to get a single representation for the graph uh, as a whole that I can then uh, make predictions uh, about molecular properties. Okay. So I'll focus on just uh, uh, two of these a little bit, the aggregate step and its consequences and the uh, uh, readout uh, step. Okay. So there's been uh, quite a few papers uh, rather recently about understanding what these models can and cannot uh, do. Okay. So let me try to uh, sort of pictorially uh, summarize a narrow segment of that uh, uh, work that's relevant for um, our purposes here. Um, so here's a, a set of all uh, n-node graphs, say uh, eight-node graphs. One point there is a graph like this, uh, where the colors now represent, say, the node labels, uh, 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 the atom properties in that uh, graph. Okay? I can define an equivalence class within that whole set of the graphs, everything that's locally isomorphic to this graph. Okay, locally in terms of the one-dimensional uh, Weisfeller-Lehman uh, test, say. Okay, so I get a subset of those uh, uh, molecules. And now I can sample another molecule within the same equivalence class. Okay, here it is. Uh, 
not eight cycle, but two, four cycles, and they're colored in a particular way so that the locally, uh, from the point of view of each atom here, its neighborhood looks identical to a neighborhood in the larger uh, molecule. Okay? And not only that, if you start expanding, say, the computational graph, uh, the computational tree, from how you would uh, update the representation for this node, it would look the same as a tree um, uh, in both graphs. Okay? So what is the consequence of that? Uh, well, that means if I apply a graph neural network to both of these graphs, I get a set of node embeddings, embeddings for the atoms as a result, but they are identical as multi-sets. Okay? So uh, any exchangeable readout operation from this set of vectors that I get through this iterative uh, application will result in identical representation for the two graphs. Okay? Put differently, graph neural networks in the standard form cannot distinguish these two graphs. It would give exactly the same answer to these two graphs, no matter how you chose the parameters of the uh, model. Okay? Uh, well, uh, we can go a step further and try to enrich this representation a little bit. Uh, uh, recall that the problem was that uh, neighbors are exchangeable. So that is uh, kind of driving this uh, failure here. So I can uh, define a smaller equivalence class uh, based on finding uh, something called uh, consistent port ordering uh, for the edges in the graph. Okay? So the edges are now no longer uh, unnamed. You have a name for each edge. So I know that I'm receiving a message from you, and I can uh, tailor how I'm uh, accommodating that information in the algorithm because I know it's coming from you. Okay? So unfortunately, uh, even in this sense, defining an equivalence class in terms of uh, local port orderings, these two graphs are still part of the same equivalence class. Okay? Even with the port ordering, you could not uh, uh, distinguish these graphs. Uh, 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 because uh, a student of mine recently actually showed this, that uh, uh, again, they result in identical uh, node embedding, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, the method, even uh, with this enhancement, couldn't distinguish uh, uh, these two graphs. And there are actually a host of graph properties that none of these algorithms can distinguish. Okay? So that's a problem in our case, uh, since molecular properties actually uh, depend on these higher order structural features, so we have to somehow build them in. Okay? So, um, Let's take an example uh, just to illustrate what that uh, means to build them in. Uh, so here's a complicated uh, molecule. Uh, it's actually a chain because it's a polymer. So it's actually built from repeated structural units, but from the point of view of a graph algorithm that would be run on an atom level, it would look hugely complicated and it wouldn't understand this chain-like structure. Okay. And as you can see, there are lots of uh, cycles there uh, in these graphs uh, that are particularly challenging for this uh, type of uh, algorithms. So what we do is we build a vocabulary of larger units. Uh, you can take this as a unit, uh, uh, the um, uh, bonded atoms, uh, si a simple pair as a unit, the larger substructure as a unit, and so on and so forth. Okay? So as a result, when you build this molecule uh, from these larger components, you see that it has this chain-like structure as it should since it's a polymer. Okay? So uh, you need to go higher up uh, uh, in terms of the uh, representation uh, to capture the properties of these molecules. Um, so one problem here is that this motif graph here, as we call it, uh, doesn't actually account for, it just gives you a symbol for its node of what substructure it is and who am I in principle connected to, to get this chain-like structure. But it does not tell me how intricately these parts fit together. Okay? So you get this sort of a very fine representation, original molecular graph, and a very coarse representation uh, that's now in terms of kind of motif symbols and how they are linked uh, together. 
Okay? So you need something uh, in between to mediate uh, this, and we introduce another one that actually considers attachments between these substructures as an intermediate uh, level of representation. And then you take not only one of them as the representation, but the whole hierarchy of these as the representation for the molecule. Okay? So uh, just briefly, uh, what it looks like is that uh, you run uh, GNN on the atom level graph. You aggregate those representations to a node here at the intermediate level that has information about what that substructure is, but also how it is attached to other things. So the vocabulary of symbols here is actually larger than the symbols at, at the highest course level. Okay. So you have this hierarchy of uh, feed-forward uh, iterated uh, neural network uh, architectures. Okay. So uh, uh, does this help at all? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so here's a simple example of uh, uh, predicting solubility um, of a molecule. Uh, so you have a simple message passing neural network. Uh, it gets to a certain error level. Uh, with just getting information about, say, atom type and uh, the bonds between them. So very rudimentary feature representation of the molecule first, and then you run GNN. The second one is you start uh, incorporating handcrafted features about the local context in which those atoms uh, appear. So you uh, include uh, degree balance, uh, whether it's in a cycle, whether it's part of an aromatic ring, and so on. Okay? So you just add features to an atom based on essentially its substructure context. Okay, you get to a better level. If you now uh, go back and only use those very simple features and let the hierarchy capture the structural context in which the atoms uh, appear in, you actually get even a better uh, result. You can, uh, so the hierarchy can learn those handcrafted features that you would otherwise have to um, build into these models. Okay. So uh, just an example that they're using these type of representations is actually already uh, quite useful. Uh, we've demonstrated that in the context of uh, antibiotic uh, discovery. Um, so once uh, you have a training set of molecules and their properties, you can train in your algorithm. Um, once you have the trained method, you can scan a much larger library of molecules in search for one that has a high potency for the property that you are really uh, interested in. Okay? Uh, what we did here um, with collaborators is take a, about a couple of thousand uh, molecules, which is a diverse set, uh, and uh, in the lab, test in a high throughput fashion uh, what their potency is towards suppressing E. coli growth. Okay? So you wanted to have antibacterial properties against this particular bug. Okay? Uh, then what you do is you have a trained model, you now scan uh, 100 million uh, molecules um, uh, and rank. Uh, them in terms of their potency to kill E. coli. Okay? And then you can take the highest uh, uh, um, uh, predicted molecules, compounds that have the highest potency, and you can test them in the lab. Many of them indeed have that uh, potency. But among them was actually an interesting molecule uh, that the method found. Uh, it's a kinase inhibitor uh, that's slightly distinct from a typical antibiotic uh, drug. Uh, it has a different mode of operation, different mechanism of how it acts uh, as well, and it was considered for a different purpose. It has high potency against E. coli, but also a high potency against a number of other very nasty bugs, okay? uh, including those that inflict, say, uh, people who are in long-term hospital care that's very hard to uh, treat. Okay? And our collaborators already tested uh, with mice that it actually is an effective treatment against these uh, uh, nasty bugs. Okay? So even if you only can learn uh, to predict properties of these molecules, you can already uh, make a huge difference in practice. All right, so uh, that's not all uh, we want to do. We actually want to go a step further 
uh, actually learn to gen uh, generate molecules that would have better properties, entirely new uh, molecules. So we need to talk about how to generate molecules in the first place and how to optimize them for the purposes uh, uh, that I wish to use them for. Okay? So uh, the task here is, uh, is uh, the following. Uh, you have, a, say, a set of pairs here of a source molecule. This is the, my starting point, a beta version, and then kind of a description of uh, this is what I wanted to get out of it. Okay? And you can change the design specs of the direction in which you wish to modify these molecules. Okay? And uh, what we're going to do is translate this task into a, a task very akin to machine translation problem in natural language. You're getting a pairs uh, of molecules now, not pairs of sentences. You get lots of uh, pairs, and you learn to map from one to the other. Okay? So you generate new molecules by translate, uh, translating. So uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, uh, what this uh, amounts to is you have a source molecule, that's a source structure, you encode it hierarchically, and then you have to somehow use that hierarchy to unravel a molecule that would have better properties, the translated uh, molecule from that representation. And uh, you learn these models end to end, from pairs of source and target uh, molecules. Okay? So it's a, uh, you have a rigidly structured object, uh, you need to represent it properly, uh, you need to generate the rigidly uh, structured object uh, um, uh, at the end. The key challenge here is actually uh, how to learn to uh, generate these molecules uh, in a meaningful way. So, the encoding of a molecule in this uh, hierarchy, three-level hierarchy that I uh, uh, mentioned before, that was actually designed to exactly capture information that I need for an autoregressive stepwise generation of adding these larger su substructure units into the molecules. Okay? So what that means uh, in terms of the picture is that at the highest level, I have those uh, larger substructures and how they are connected together. So the first decision when I'm unraveling this molecule further is to pick what is the next substructure that I wish to generate and who is it connected to. Okay? That's uh, done on the basis of the node representations at the highest level. Okay? Then you go down, that's not sufficient, now I have to decide which part of this new substructure is actually connected uh, to the previous part of the molecule. So that decision now uses the additional attachment information uh, that I have in the previous, uh, in the intermediate layer. And finally, I need to decide how this substructure with that component attaching somewhere here, exactly which atoms uh, it is attached to. Okay? And that's done at the lower, uh, lowest level uh, uh, in terms of the decision. So you get this autoregressive sequential way uh, of unraveling a molecule one substructure at a time. Picking the substructure, uh, which part of it attaches, and then precisely how it is attached to the uh, uh, molecule that's being generated. Okay? Now, uh, this uh, hierarchical generation actually carries a number of benefits. Here's uh, one illustration of it. Uh, so what if you train this model and then you're getting a test uh, molecule and you just ask, can I reconstruct it? Can I encode it and I can, can I unravel the same uh, molecule? Okay? So a simple generative uh, graph generation model that's based on, say, atom by atom generation here starts really failing as the molecule becomes larger. Okay? Uh, but if you generate the molecule in this hierarchical uh, fashion, substructure uh, at a time, uh, you actually maintain the accuracy of reconstruction regardless of the size of the molecule that you generate. Okay? 
as is sort of a typical in these type of models, you need to explicate and connect the information with very low, short connections in order for these uh, models to work well. And if you generate it atom by atom very quickly, it starts forgetting what the actual uh, context is, and uh, it's harder to plan to unravel the molecule. Okay. Um, so there are other uh, uh, pieces to it, how to model diversity. You don't want just to generate the... Uh, 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 we'll uh, switch uh, uh, back and forth. Uh, um, all right, so uh, you want to model uh, the diversity so from uh, any particular source. You don't want to uh, generate just a single... Uh, uh, output, but a population, a diverse population of candidate molecules that would all have the desired uh, properties, and that you can incorporate uh, with a latent variable into this model. Similarly, you incorporate the fact that uh, you, the translation from molecule to molecule is directed. You direct it towards a particular property, so you need to input that direction uh, somehow. All right, so uh, the challenge here, uh, or one challenge uh, uh, that's not quite solved uh, yet, um, is really that the training data that you have for these kind of a directed translations is typically of marginal kind. So I have a pair of molecule, and it's better property version, but in terms of a single property. Okay? For another property, I have a starting point and a better uh, version, and so on. But I have very few examples of going in a kind of a combinatorial direction from the starting molecule. So that's really an extrapolation uh, that you're trying to solve here when you are directing it into kind of a yet unexplored uh, direction and trying to uh, make it work. All right, so uh, just to uh, illustrate a little bit how this uh, uh, works, I'm just going to make two quick points about this. Uh, uh, so the graph, uh, the bar on the right is the current model. Uh, this uh, here is a model uh, that was uh, uh, the top performing model in, say, one to two years uh, ago. Okay? And this the scale here is the percent success that when you're taking a molecule and you're translating it, what is the percent of the time uh, that the generated new molecule has the property that you want? Okay? So from 3% uh, to 85% uh, success rate. That just highlights sort of a how fast this area is moving into something that nobody would want to try into something that actually companies are now interested in uh, uh, exploring uh, the molecules that we generate. Uh, right, so that's an excellent point. So these are actually, uh, with respect to, it's, uh, these results are in part synthetic in the sense that there is a separate uh, predictor uh, that tries to assess the property and you're measuring against that. Uh, the problem here is since you are generating an entirely new molecule, uh, so to, to, to truly assess whether it satisfies the property, you would actually have to uh, run it through a lab. Similarly to the uh, antibiotic discovery where actually a small set was run uh, 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 through in vitro studies. Tell me, yeah. In terms of feasibility, can you just create anyone or are there somehow constraints that make sure? So uh, these uh, sort of the criteria here uh, was that you, since uh, typically in the sort of a pharmaceutical discovery, you have a lead that you already know is sort of good. So you want something that's similar uh, to the starting point and has a better properties. So the similarity here is part of the success probability that you want something uh, that makes some structural changes but not a sort of a from scratch uh, new molecule. So you can do anything? You, in principle, you can put, uh, it's not clear that it would work as well, but in principle, the criteria that you're aiming for could be anything. This is just another example that highlights the same uh, thing uh, from a kind of a uh, useless method uh, to a useful uh, uh, method in, uh, in a rapid turnaround. 
All right, so uh, what's still difficult, uh, this is an illustration of that, uh, is this multi-criteria uh, uh, optimization, where you are going in a direction that you haven't really explored in the training uh, data. Uh, so the numbers here in terms of going into new direction, the success rate uh, goes down considerably as a result. Uh, the model hasn't really been uh, directly trained uh, towards that. But in the sort of a low uh, teens uh, success uh, percentage is already starting to be useful. You can uh, sample 10, a diverse set of 10 molecules and run them through the lab and at least get one uh, that actually would have that uh, property. So it's reaching it, but not quite there yet. Uh, I'm uh, going to skip this. Uh, you can do ablation studies of uh, figuring out that actually the PCs that I described are all necessary to get the level of uh, performance. The last thing that I wanted to uh, talk about uh, uh, is that uh, there are like a sort of a stochastic gradient design, which is an embarrassingly simple algorithm that works incredibly well in practice. Uh, there are also additional incredibly simple things that you can do to make these uh, models work much uh, better. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one example of uh, such a method. So uh, we've already discussed that uh, it's very hard to learn to translate from one structure uh, to another. Okay? It's a much simpler problem to learn to predict its properties. Okay, so from a smaller training set, you should be able to learn a better predictor than a translation model. Okay, so somehow that predictor should be able to help uh, the model to get even better. Because now you essentially have a free assessor of the candidates that I generate. Uh, I can weed out those that don't appear to be good and provide them as additional targets uh, uh, for the model. So we should be able to uh, kind of augment additional targets in a semi-supervised uh, uh, fashion to make these models work even better. Okay. So uh, theoretically, this is uh, actually a very simple uh, uh, setup, uh, a flashback from the 70s. It's just a stochastic version of an EM algorithm where the likelihood model uh, is now the property predictor. It assesses any particular uh, the probability that you, the molecule, any particular molecule, satisfies the uh, design specs that I want. The prior here is the translation model uh, that I trained. It tries to take an input, the source molecule, and generate valid um, targets that would have those properties. And you're just trying to maximize the probability um, that your generated candidates uh, would satisfy the design criteria according to the property predictor that you trained. Okay? So you have a, a classifier that tells you if, if it's going to have the property? Yes. So I, uh, you give me a data set uh, that has uh, essentially molecules and their properties. I can arrange that data set into pairs of a molecule and a bad air molecule. The, that's the training data for the translation model. I can also, at the same time, take that data and train a property predictor for any molecule uh, predict its uh, properties. Now the question is, how do I combine the two to make it even uh, work even better? Do you get gradients and back through everything? Uh, well, uh, only in a heuristic way, since the summation here is over all possible molecular graphs that I could generate. So I can't uh, really uh, sum uh, through it. Um, uh, so this is just sort of a, essentially for an illustration of what I'm aiming for. Uh, uh, maybe you mentioned this, I came late uh, for your talk, uh, but it is in some sense an inverse problem. Uh, the likely, I'm, I want to invert the likelihood model, which is the property predictor, and find instances of a molecule that score high relative to that. Uh, that inverse problem is actually quite challenging. Uh, in principle, I couldn't train the model in this way, um, because I can't draw posterior samples. Uh, the model itself, the translation model, the prior is highly complicated. Um, uh, I don't understand it fully. I don't understand how it intersects with the likelihood model. So drawing those samples is incredibly hard. Okay? What saves us here, actually, uh, is the fact that the prior model here is already quite good. 
okay, based on the previous results. It actually, with uh, relatively high probability, generates uh, valid molecules that have the property that I want. Not all the time, but uh, some of the time, okay? So you can actually solve this with a simple uh, um, rejection sampling uh, scheme. You generate targets for any molecule that you have, you generate valid targets, you weed out with the property predictor those that don't appear to be good. That gives you additional valid targets for your translation model and you can retrain the translation model. Okay? So that algorithm is nothing but an EM algorithm, but cast in a stochastic uh, fashion. And the only reason I can run it is because um, the translation model is already good. Otherwise, it would be rather hopeless to try to uh, get the posterior. All right. Um, so this is just an illustration of uh, uh, generating a, a target and weeding out uh, some based on the property predictor. So how well does this combination work? Uh, so here's a, a comparison. Here's the previous model that I talked about, already uh, quite good uh, in terms of uh, different uh, properties. When you just add this uh, simple um, stochastic EM component, you actually cut the error rate uh, that is the probability that when I generate a candidate molecule that it would not have the properties uh, that I want, you cut the error rate by threefold. Okay? So it's a, quite an improvement with a very, very simple uh, uh, idea. Okay? And perhaps surprisingly, the effect is uh, very, very robust. So if you make the property predictor simpler and simpler, so it's, uh, it's very easy to estimate from the data that I have, more, and, uh, uh, more easier the simpler it is, but its error rate uh, as a predictor goes down, okay? And you maintain the gain in terms of uh, improving the translation model almost to the point where the error level of the property predictor is on the same level as the target range that I'm aiming for, okay? When I really, truly, information theoretically lose the signal, uh, at that point, the uh, gain starts going away, okay? That just highlights how challenging the prediction of a new structure uh, is. So this is kind of a uh, sending analogous to sort of over-parameterization in neural networks. Some simple things work uh, in a new context, uh, whereas this type of approach would not have been used previously in a simple classification setting in a semi-supervised uh, context. It wouldn't work uh, nearly as well. All right, so uh, the point here uh, that I'm trying to uh, get across is that these molecules as structured objects, they're actually uh, uh, embody many of the challenges that we would ha we have uh, uh, in terms of predicting properties, uh, generating, manipulating uh, complex uh, objects. Uh, and they're actually becoming uh, uh, already used, uh, uh, our collaborators in pharmaceutical companies are already uh, uh, using these methods, including the uh, generation part. But there are lots of things that are unsolved uh, 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 in this context. Uh, you would want to incorporate physical features that you know actually generalize to new chemical spaces. That's a very hard problem. How do I train a method from a subset of molecules and then have some guarantees that it actually works in an entirely new part of the chemical space? Okay? The only way truly to generalize is to have a physics model. So how do I do something intermediate that have some invariance that help me uh, make that jump. Uh, there are, there's a lot of sort of a theoretically motivated work that you can do to uh, make this multi-criteria optimization much more solid and uh, well-founded uh, in this space. There are issues of uh, sort of uh, explaining, drawing insights, uh, chemical insights from these models that's an uh, um, uh, entirely new uh, uh, area of research. Um, so um, uh, that's about it. Uh, hopefully, uh, what I tried to highlight is that there's actually quite a bit of need for theory uh, here in terms of understanding how to make use of structured uh, objects. And the only way to solve it is, is to have a framework to formalize the problem 
as well as the method and what the algorithms can and cannot use uh, um, based on those structures. So with that, I will stop. Thank you.